The next item on the order paper is a motion on nice guidance on fertility. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. That this assembly recognises the serious emotional distress felt by those experiencing fertility problems in our society, notes that the Department of Health has endorsed the 2013 National Institute for Health and Care Excellence NICE, Clinical Guide Guideline on Fertility CG156, commends the efforts of those campaigning for the full implementation of NICE guidance on in vitro fertilization IVF, welcomes the commitment with a new decade new approach to make three cycles of IVF treatment available on the NHS, and calls on the Minister of Health to implement fully, as a matter of urgency, the NICE guidance on fertility, including making three cycles of IVF available, as committed to in New Decade, New Approach. Thank you. I call on Mr. Colin Gildenew to move the motion. Motion, can I call you? Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate as two amendments have been selected and are published on the Marshall list, an additional 15 minutes has been added to the total time. The proposer will have 10 minutes to propose this motion and 10 minutes to wind. Before I invite Mr Gildernew to open the debate on this motion, I would remind members that maiden speeches are heard by convention in this House without interruption. I call Mr Gildernew. Um, I would like to just state today how proud I am to rise to speak as a representative of Fermanagh and South Tyrone, a historic constituency, and a constituency which I have often reflected on, which a parliamentarian from a neighbouring island once referred to as the dreary steeples of Fermanagh and Tyrone. Well, I would like to recalibrate that by saying that I am deeply proud to represent the fantastic people of Fermanagh and South Tyrone. I am proud to represent it from the engineering and economic heartlands and manufacturing bases from Dungannon to Derry Lynn, from historic and world renowned Balik to historic Ben Borb, and from the magnificent mountains of Kilkey to my own beautiful Brantry. I would also like to acknowledge the uh, efforts in this House of my predecessor uh, in terms of her representation of the constituency, not only because that is a well earned and deeply, deeply deserved, but also as many of you know that I'd be in serious difficulty if I didn't <laughs> acknowledge, <laughs> acknowledge it at the home place on Sunday evening. So, members, I'd like to move now to the uh, motion in front of us. The availability of IVF treatment is an emotive and sensitive matter. It is often a deeply stressful and challenging time for all concerned. There are daily reminders of the problems and often no way to get away from it. We're thinking of uh, times like Christmas. Father's Day, Mother's Day, and people who are desperate to start families don't have access to IVF treatment that they deserve. This has been a very long campaign, and there's been debates on this matter going back as far as March 2012, when the then Health, Social Services and Public Safety Committee brought a motion before the House, and there have since been numerous queries from a broad range of interested MLAs on this issue. In response to a, que a written question, the Health Minister has raised issues with not having enough trained staff or the room and space to provide these services. I know there will be many here eager to hear directly from the Minister today on how he plans to overcome these challenges in the time ahead. Members, the recent paper produced by the British and Irish Government explicitly refers to the commitment that the Executive will provide three funded cycles of IVF treatment. I would also like to welcome the inclusion of the Education and Information Amendment, Amendment number two. I believe it adds positively to the motion and matches the intent and desire to improve health outcomes for all. It is important, in my view, that we destigmatize and remove any notion that talking about fertility or sex education is wrong. I also acknowledge the intent behind the first noted amendment, which seeks to address a concern relating to current capacity issues and the potential for discrimination to occur for those at the upper end of the age limit. While there may be some concern that this could effectively disadvantage younger people, I accept that as a short-term measure, this would have merit, and we are therefore content to support the amendment also on that basis. Giancorlia, I now wish to add a few brief remarks as Chair of the Health Committee. The Health Committee was briefed on the 30th of January this year by the Permanent Secretary 
and senior officials on health priorities arising from the new decade new approach document. The Permanent Secretary advised the committee that even should resources be made available immediately, the regional fertility clinic does not have the capacity to start delivering three cycles of IVF treatment to all eligible women immediately. Further to a question from a member of the committee, we then wrote to the department to follow up on the Permanent Secretary's commitment to give consideration to whether the promised three cycles of IVF could be provided outside the north. For women close to the age threshold for treatment in light of the acknowledged limited capacity, the committee re awaits a reply to this query with interest. Kion Kjolja, I commend this motion to the House. Gorham Thank you, and I congratulate the member on making his maiden speech. Having served on the Communities Committee under the chairmanship of his sister, I can assure him he would have been in diffs if the praise hadn't been fulsome, so congratulations. Um, I now move to uh, the um, debate on amendment number one, and I call on Mr Mark Durkin to move that amendment. Is to move. Thank you. Uh, you will have ten minutes to propose amendment one and five minutes to wind, so I now invite Mr Mark Durkin to open the debate on amendment number one. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I rise in support of the motion and to propose uh, Amendment No. 1. Uh, the proposer of the uh, motion has outlined quite clearly the rationale behind their motion, and I commend those who have brought this very sensitive and emotive and important issue to this House. I had tabled a very similar motion uh, near the end of the last Assembly mandate which sadly never made it uh, to this stage due to the collapse of the Assembly. And we can't avoid or deny the fact that progress in terms of making three cycles of IVF treatment available on the NHS as per the NICE guidelines has been prevented and slowed immeasurably due to the fact that we haven't been here for three years. But we are here now. In the meantime, Though I do not believe it is an exaggeration to say that couples, and in some cases individuals, have spent hundreds of thousands of pounds collectively and travelled very far and wide in order to access treatment and maximise their chances of conception and of having a baby they so badly want and have so much love to give. People have got into debt, borrowing money, remortgaging their homes, putting themselves under massive financial pressure. And it's not only financial pressure, as Colm Gilderney said, that people are under. The pressure that this whole process puts on relationships as partners blame themselves and partners sometimes blame each other. The feeling of failure and incompleteness that many people uh, who have been through or who are going through uh, this treatment under the current process have relayed to me the detrimental impact of all this stress on people's mental health cannot be measured, but it certainly can't be understated either. In the three years that we haven't had an assembly, however, a lot of work has been done on this issue, and I commend, as the motion does, those organisations who have worked so hard not only to keep this issue on our agenda to keep it in the public domain and to ensure political support for when and if we were going to get up and run in again, but the work that they've done to support people, to support people, they're there for people, to advise them, to direct them, to encourage them and to console them. They're there for people at the worst of times, and I've seen that in, in my own constituency, pay particular tribute, as I'm sure Karen Mullen will. Uh, later on to Fairness and Fertility, who, who operate in Derry. They've been there at the worst of times, and they're also there at the best of times to celebrate some of the good news stories that do, the great news stories that, that, that do come out of treatment when people are fortunate enough that, that the stars align in their favour. So fair play to those organisations. Now, it's my understanding, and maybe the Minister will be in a position to clarify this, that a number of years ago, perhaps it was in 2016, there had been a planned pilot scheme to move 
to two funded cycles of IVF treatment. I wasn't able to find any of that in the information pack, but it is my understanding that that, that, that was the case and that it just disappeared from view. I don't know who made that decision, how that decision was made, and I certainly don't know why that decision was made. That wouldn't be going as far as the three, which is where we want to go as per the guidelines, but it would have certainly been a, a step in the right direction. So, uh, in, in terms of the amendment, I'm pleased to hear uh, that Sinn Féin will be supporting uh, our amendment, which does focus on women uh, who are approaching the upper threshold of 40. Uh, and, and it is a short-term measure that we see this prioritisation taking place. Uh, people now, because of the contents of the new decade, new approach deal, have had their hopes raised. These are people who have been frustrated for a long, long time, given the nature of, of, of what they are dealing with. Now they have had their hopes raised, and I think it is important that we meet those hopes with action as an Assembly and uh, as an Executive. I have to say, because while this motion will call, and understandably, on the Minister for Health to progress this and ensure that what is promised or was promised in that agreement is implemented. I think there is definitely a collective responsibility on the executive to do that. And should the minister, in this case for health, come forward looking for financial assistance from executive colleagues in order to ensure delivery of pledges and promises made in that agreement, the parties, who I hope will all be supporting uh, this motion and speaking in favour today, I hope their colleagues around the executive table will back any ministerial uh, request. We have seen it already. Like the new decade, new approach promised pay parity, that that issue would be resolved. And uh, while we are delighted that it was able to be, at a much bigger financial cost than this, albeit uh, ex extremely worthy, uh, the First and Deputy First Minister and the Finance Minister we're all glad to, to, to come out and make that announcement alongside the Health Minister. And I don't care who makes this announcement or, or how it's made, but, uh, the, and the people out there won't care who makes it or how it's made either, as long as it's made that uh, we are going to fulfil the promises made in that uh, agreement and we're going to give them a chance of fulfilling uh, their dreams. So, uh, like I say, I, I welcome the stated support from the proposers for our amendment and uh, commend the motion and amendment number one. We have no issue with uh, amendment number two either. It is no way contradictory or, or, or that with our own and adds to the motion as amended. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I now call on Mrs Pam Cameron to move amendment number two. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, could I move Amendment Number Two? Thank you. Um, you will have ten minutes to propose Amendment Two and five minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. Please open the debate on Amendment Two, Mrs. Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And members will note that this, uh, this amendment in no way alters the main objective of this motion. Indeed, we welcome the motion before the House today and fully support it. And uh, I want the stage just to thank Karen Mullen and Colin Gildernew for bringing the motion to this House um, today. In terms of the Amendment 1 made by Mark Durkin and Sinead Bradley, we also welcome and recognise um, the great pressure on time for those who are close to that 40 threshold in age, and also welcome that, that this is intended that it would be a, a short term measure. So, uh, for our amendment number two today, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, um, our amendment is to approach the issue in what we believe is a more holistic way, and I will elaborate further um, on this rationale later in my remarks. For those of us who have children, there is certainly no greater moment in life than when you are carrying a child inside you, or when you are or when you hold your baby in, in your arms for the first time. And I count myself incredibly blessed to have three amazing children. But of course, as we look back on our youth, I'm sure many of us recollect saying things like, when I have children, or discussing with friends about how many children we'd like to have. 
And at that stage in life, it all seems so simple, as if it's a right. It is one of those things that just happens. Yet for many, the reality of parenthood does not come that easy. For some, it never comes at all. I know many who have been through the struggle. Indeed, to say that they have come through the struggle is not right, for it remains a case of coping with it each and every day. And like all battles, some cope better than others, as the heartbreak of not having the family you always dreamed of becomes a daily reality. Infertility, we know, is a taboo subject. And in many ways, that is why we believe that our amendment adds something really valuable to this motion. Awareness can be an incredibly powerful tool, one that can inform our own choices early in life, choices which can help keep us healthy and hopefully fertile. In reality, we probably concentrate more on reducing unwanted pregnancies, especially in our teens and twenties, and don't necessarily consider all the potential impact of our day-to-day -day living and how that can impact on our future. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm conscious that some members may not be aware of the nature of the Your Future Fertility Programme in Scotland, and I'd like to put on the record my thanks to Hilary Knight from Fertility UK for briefing me on the topic, and I'm sure and uh, I'm sure my colleagues from the Health Committee will be hearing more from this particular charitable organisation who support those on their fertility journey. And I would say that this organisation, like many, do a terrific work, and it is vital that we ensure that they are funded to continue that work going forward. At a high level, the aims of the Your Future Fertility Pro Project are to provide fertility information and education in universities, to GPs and in the workplace to ensure that people are better informed on all aspects of fertility issues, including how to take care of their fertility and how and when it declines. To raise awareness among young people at university of fertility issues and to educate them about the issues that can impact fertility, such as sexually transmitted diseases and lifestyle choices. To reduce the incidence of fertility problems, through improved outcomes in terms of sexual health and lifestyle, and to alleviate the effect on those already affected by this illness through information, self-help and support by providing information events throughout Scotland. When we look at the experience of Scotland since rolling out this programme, we can see that the outcomes have been wholly positive. We do lack this education provision here in Northern Ireland, and many of those within the medical field who deal with fertility issues, mental health and other health provision are supportive of this programme being implemented in Northern Ireland. The following are quotations from the Northern Ireland health professionals regarding the Your Future Fertility Education project. So, uh, just to give you a few quotes here, Dr Ishola Agabaji, Subspecialist in Reproductive Care at NHS Regional Fertility Centre Belfast, and he is saying, Fertility Networks, your future fertility project is an essential public health programme and a real opportunity to educate young people on the impact of lifestyle factors and on their future fertility. There is a lack of knowledge regarding the potential negative effects of factors such as age, STIs, obesity, smoking, anabolic steroids, Unfertility and an, an overestimation of the success of treatments such as IVF. Educational initiatives like this have the potential to make a much greater impact on individuals' fertility health and their choices than treatments alone and should be commended. And then we had Martha Campbell, Family Therapy Lead at ACSM, Family Trauma Centre and Eating Disorder Youth Service, Belfast CAMS. And she's quoted as saying, I believe this will be one of the most important areas of development in adult mental health as we see increasing numbers of couples and women seeking support in relation to fertility in the future. The emphasis should be placed on early intervention and education in order to support them in their future choices. We in CAMS would welcome any partnership and support you could offer us in the future years. I look forward to hearing from you um, and working together as your project develops. And then we had Dr. Ursula Brennan, Mount Oriel Medical Practice Belfast, who's quoted as saying, Fertility Networks, your future fertility project, has supported the general practice community to support, educate and influence young people on health issues which will impact on their future fertility. As a GP working in Belfast, I've been aware of the gap in education 
and learning opportunities for primary health care professionals in the area of, of fertility medicine. It is exciting to learn this project raised both student and professional clinicians' awareness of fertility issues, including the emotional impact. In, current, in the current environment of healthcare redesign and transformation, I am confident that investing in fertility health-related issues will have a positive impact now and in the future. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, in recent days, some members of this House have been accused of not listening to professionals as we attempt to deliver better outcomes for our constituents. And these are the words of professionals. And I think that they state a better case than I can for this programme to be introduced. And my hope is that this House agrees. On the substantive motion, Mr. Speaker, we fully support the aims and objectives and congratulate the members for bringing this forward. The new decade, new approach document deals with the vast range of issues, some of which matter to all people and some to specific interest groups. Like many, I was delighted the document commits to the NI Executive providing three full cycles of IVF. For too long, we in Northern Ireland have failed those on this journey. Across the rest of the UK, there remains huge inconsistencies in terms of what provision is given, and I firmly believe that there is a moral duty on the government to fully fund full cycles of treatment and not to leave patients with sometimes huge private bills to fund themselves in order to complete a cycle of treatment. It is wholly appropriate that NICE guidelines are adopted entirely and as soon as possible. There is undoubtedly a, a job of work for the Minister to do in relation to the mechanism of delivery and how we meet the demands of this commitment. We know that the capacity of the current provision at the RVH is an issue and the financial aspect is another consideration but I would ask what price is a life. We must also explore whether the partnerships are needed with the private sector to ensure swift implementation of this commitment. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, last week in this chamber I moved a motion to introduce mandatory autism training for teachers and it united this house. It was motivated by a desire to help those who need help and I'm glad that once again the focus on this, of this house is not on tribal issues, but we are once again we are seeking to help those who need help. This is why devolution matters. This is what we can do when we unite and work together. And I commend the motion and the amendment to the House. Thank you very much. We now, <coughs> excuse me, we now move on to the main list. And the first speaker is the member for North Down, Mr Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, for far too long, women in Northern Ireland have faced discrimination in the provision of IVF treatment. The NICE guidance clearly states that a woman should be offered up to three cycles of IVF. It does that for very good clinical reasons. It's just a reality that IVF is not always successful first time round. The success rates vary with the age of the woman. For many women, there is usually a 20% success rate after one cycle of IVF treatment. That means that for every five women and couples, that place so much hope on a one-off procedure, four will not get pregnant after one cycle. That's the heartbreaking reality of fertility treatment. It was an injustice that the Ulster Unionist Party has long felt needed to be closed. That is why this party secured its inclusion into the new decade, new approach document. On the 3rd of January, almost a week before the final document was published, the Ulster Unionist Party submitted the request to the Northern Ireland Office and the local Department of Finance, and we were delighted to see it in the final document. Whilst it is positive to see the cross-party support in the Chamber today for the policy, regrettably the reality is that both Sinn Féin and the DUP previously had the opportunity to move Northern Ireland to three cycles, but chose not to make a public commitment. Of course, the reality is that it will require additional funding. However, this is something the Minister is likely already pursuing with the Finance Minister. However, I am confident that the Minister from the party that secured the commitment, the current Health Minister, will be dedicated to trying to make key progress. That said, there has been a lot of words of support coming from all the parties in the Executive towards addressing the many problems and pressing issues faced by the health service in Northern Ireland. I know that my colleague, Minister Robin Swan, will be working hard to solve all these issues in a timely fashion. However, his job will be made much more difficult 
if the required resources are not made available to him. I have said that there have been many words of support around repairing our health service from other parties in the executive, but these words must be translated into action. And I know that Minister Swan is totally committed to deliver what is required. However, he must receive the budget required to enable this delivery. The provision of this treatment being debated today may not seem relevant to those on lengthy waiting lists for surgery and other treatments, but it is a declaration of hope for those parents experiencing difficulty in trying to start a family. I am confident that the discrimination towards parents in Northern Ireland in relation to fertility treatment will be addressed by the Department from today, but that hope will only materialise if the Minister is allocated the budget and resources he will undoubtedly need to honour this heartfelt cry for help and hope. It should be no surprise to the House that the Ulster Unionist Party will be supporting this motion and both amendments today. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Mrs Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. Um, Principal Deputy Speaker. I, I'm only going to rise to say a few words um, today, but I just wanted to place on record that we will be supporting the motion and both amendments. I want to commend Sinn Féin, SDLP and DUP for bringing forward the motion and the two amendments. I think that in the round it, it makes for, for a, a good debate here this afternoon. Um, from the Alliance Party point of view, um, we, we very much welcome the commitment in the New Deal, New Approach document, um, we, not just for its very practical aspect of it, but also it provides an opportunity for um, the issue of infertility and difficulties with conceiving being debated in a public forum. Um, we have to work towards removing the taboo that women feel and face whenever they cannot have children. Um, I would also commend those individuals and groups who have campaigned for many years to secure multiple um, cycles. And I would draw um, reference also to Here and I. People will know that as a voluntary organisation works with lesbian um, uh, and their families and their own campaign to um, encourage the access of IVF treatment for same-sex couples. I um, have friends who have paid for IVF treatments out of their own household um, funds. Um, I know that that puts a considerable strain on, a, on an already very, very difficult situation. Um, so this there, this would very much be, if we go back 10 years, I'm sure my, my friends would be absolutely thrilled that they would be given this opportunity. Um, so very much we're going to um, support Amendment 1. I became a, a mother at 27. Um, but I had friends who were giving birth right up into the, their early 40s. And that's part of the growing trend where women are empowered to uh, make those decisions as and when it suits themselves in terms of their family circumstances, their professional career and other factors. And the fact that people, women are, are living longer, healthier lives, that I think that it's right and proper that, this, that the um, proposal and the programme coming forward would, re would reflect the nice guidelines in terms of access up, up, up into those later years. So in terms of Amendment 2, um, your future fertility programme and education and information programme, um, I think that it, it's a wonderful um, proposal today and very much supported and it feeds very much into um, the need for us to empower young women to, to deal with all matters relating to their sexual and reproductive health. So, um, like Colm and other speakers here this afternoon, I am conscious of what we have been told at the Health Committee in terms of the, while the Health Department are obviously very much in favour of this as a commitment, it, the um, problem will, will the, the, the train will come off the tracks whenever there is maybe the budget, the resources, the um, workforce there to deliver on it. So I, like others here today, very much look forward to hearing what the Minister has to say, but um, I commend the motion to the House. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mr Alex Easton. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Fewer numbers of IVF treatments take place in Northern Ireland than anywhere in Britain. Women in Northern Ireland underwent 1,498 in comparison with those in London, the highest area which saw women receive 16,649 cycles of treatment during 2014. A quarter of a million babies in Britain have been born as a result of IVF. Publicly funded IVF 
fertility treatment in Northern Ireland began in 2001 when the, the then Minister for Health announced the intention to consult on the provision of fertility services and introduce criteria for treatment in the interim. The consultation began in 2003 and revised criteria were introduced in 2006, which widened access to treatment. A second review was held in 2008 in response to an assembly motion calling on the department to review the criteria used to access eligibility. The ongoing problem with waiting lists and the number of IVF treatments available on the NHS, with a view to establishing a more equitable policy. As a result, a regional waiting list for fertility treatment from 2009 was created. In Northern Ireland, responsibility for the commissioning of fertility services lies with the Health and Social Care Board. While the department had endorsed the NICE guidelines in practice, treatment is limited to one fresh and one frozen embryo transfer. The following criteria apply. There may be a medical cause of infertility. The female patient must be under 40 years of age when starting treatment. The female patient should have no more than three previous unsuccessful treatments. Only patients referred to the regional fertility centre after the 1st of April 2012 are eligible. There are no restrictions on the status of the couple, the age of man or the dependent children. A woman must be no older than 39 for treatment with donor eggs. The provision of one fresh and one frozen embryo transfer falls short of a full cycle as defined by the NICE guidelines. Storage costs for frozen embryos are publicly funded only for two years after treatment, after which they must be paid for privately. The former Health Minister acknowledged that the service in Northern Ireland falls short of the NICE guidelines due to the significant cost implications and other ongoing budget pressures, but advised that the Department would consider options for further service provision and examine all practical options for improving the service currently offered. One in seven people across Northern Ireland experience difficulty having children. Greater access to IVF are, are very important and vital. I want to see a wider access to IVF treatment on the NHS with an increased entitlement to the three full cycles, as in the case of Scotland. Our people need to be supported and educated on the process. Support services are essential to ensure people are assisted on every step of their journey. There are promises to, be, uh, to provide three full cycles of IVF treatment as committed in the new decade, new approach. I support the motion and my colleague's amendment. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much. Um, the next person I have on the list is Gemma Dolan. And as this is a maiden speech, it will be heard without interruption. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, it's an honour for me to be here representing the people of Fermanagh and South Throne. And it's an honour for me to, be, to take part in a debate of such importance. As this is my maiden speech, please allow me to digress a little. I am from a lovely border village called Balik in County Fermanagh, 112 miles away from Parliament buildings. If I wanted to get public transport to here, it would take three buses. I'd actually be quicker going to Galway. But I'm a very proud Balik woman, a very proud Fermanagh woman. I wouldn't change it for the world. And I hope to provide representation for my constituents that makes them proud also. The reason I agreed to stand as a candidate in the 2017 Assembly election was because I felt there wasn't enough women's voices in the Assembly. On top of that, there wasn't enough young women's voices in this chamber, but in particular, there wasn't enough young rural women's voices being heard. And this is an issue that affects many women, including women and couples in my constituency. In October 2018, I attended a furnace in fertility event in the Long Gallery and it remains one of the most powerful and eye-opening events I have ever attended. One quote stuck with me, and it was this, there is one thing more painful than having a baby, and that is not having a baby. It is said that about one in six males and females suffer from fertility problems of some kind. With numbers like that, it's a very common problem and has actually been recognized by the World Health Organization as a disease. They define infertility as an impairment of function and a disease of the reproductive system. Infertility is a medical condition and as with any other medical condition, it is deserving of treatment. The importance of funding fertility treatment is also highlighted by the well-recognised and devastating psychological impact the disease can have. Infertility can lead to stress, anxiety, clinical depression and the breakdown of relationships. It is therefore important we remember that the provision of services 
is not only focused on the clinical cycle, but also on holistic care for the individuals seeking treatment. As part of the wider need to address the issue of poverty of esteem for mental health, we must take account of the challenges and pressure of undergoing fertility treatment. There is a range of fertility counselling services based out of the Heron Road in Belfast. However, by all accounts that I am aware of, it is limited in its scope and the opportunity for outreach to parts of the North are limited and often rely on telephone cover. This is not acceptable and it is a poor reflection of a regional service. The former Health Minister acknowledged that the service here falls short of NICE guidelines, which has been recommending three funded cycles be made available as far back as 2004. For myself, as a 29-year-old woman, the fact that for women aged 23 to 35 there is just a 20% success rate after one cycle is a fact that hits close to home. However, there is a 60% better success rate if there are three cycles completed. Infertility cruelly removes the choice of having children from people. Some couples end up spending their life savings trying to complete their family, and some can put themselves into serious debt in order to achieve that dream. Adopting the NICE guidance will also go some way in improving access for same-sex couples in accessing an important and life-changing service. For many, there will be an urgency in addressing the capacity and staffing issues as the age limit of 40 approaches. I am keen to hear how the Minister will ensure that for all those involved they can access a full three rounds of treatment in a timely manner. I appeal to the Minister to implement NICE guidance without delay and attempt to give thousands of couples across the North the greatest gift of all. Thank you. Thank you. And this is becoming a bit of a routine for me, but can I congratulate the member on her maiden speech and uh, wish her all the best as she represents the people of Fermanagh and South Tyrone. The next person on my list is Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'd like to rise in support of the motion and thank my colleagues for bringing it forward here. And um, I warmly welcome the fact that we're debating this in the Chamber because it is, for many, a very, very critical issue. There are few issues more important than starting a family in life and few decisions bigger. And I'm delighted, delighted to be speaking as the SDLP's health spokesperson on that issue. The expansion of IVF provision in line with NICE guidelines has been a key priority for the SDLP in a recent manifest, manifesto commitment and one which our negotiators, like others, continue to stress as part of the talks process. There is no doubt that this will make a tangible difference in the lives of families across the North, one in seven of whom are having difficulty conceiving. That is a staggering figure and it is a reality that we talk about mental health and we talk about lots of issue in here and it's something that goes deep to that issue. The longing to have a child and the need for support is one that should never be overlooked in this house. Many people have got themselves into huge financial difficulties in trying to fund this and it's something that IVF on the private market, they have the emotional draw of that group of people who have not been able to get IVF through the health service. And people have gone to great lengths to have that access to IVF, to, to really settle that inward question of can they be a mother, a father or a parent? And it, very often at great financial cost to themselves. And it just seems very unfair that some people could be ruled out of being a parent due to finances. It's only right that the access to IVF is expanded to three cycles and our friends in Scotland have shown us that this is not a huge cost to the public purse. It's relatively small. And Mr Speaker, I warmly welcome the inclusion of the IVF provision expansion in the new decade, new approach. I think it did speak to the fact that many here are supportive of the issue and I want to support uh, Minister Swan in, in going forward on this issue. However, we must be realistic. During the recent meeting of the Health Committee, the Permanent Secretary did outline the commitment to making the three-cycle provision available, but Mr Pengelly also very honestly outlined that there was severe limitation and resource around this issue. He cited workforce and the infrastructure that's required. 
meaning that the expansion of IVF, whilst aiming to be delivered, could not be delivered in the immediate term, and we may be looking at a time delay. That gives reason to the amendment that the SDLP have proposed here, because unfortunately, Mother Nature waits for nobody, and there are very sound clinical reasons why women of a certain age group should have immediate access to this service. And I recognise that that will put difficulty on resources, but I think we should be mindful of those women because IVF is important to all women and potential mothers and fathers who are, who are accessing it. Absolutely. Member, for given way. Will the member uh, agree with me that the stress and anxiety does lead to poor mental health amongst those who are waiting to be able to be a parent, and therefore that should be taken account of as well? Absolutely, I do. I, I concur with that. And, the, and member, it's all, the member has an additional minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's also a, an issue that we have to realise that it's a very private and personal issue, and not many people may feel able to openly talk about it. And whilst mental health, good advice is always to share and, and uh, I suppose, half your problem by sharing on these very personal issues, that's sometimes not just as easily to engage in, so absolutely take the point. The, the reason behind the amendment um, for those particular women of that age threshold is important, but it is worth citing as well, whilst the age 40 has been mentioned, there are clinical conditions under, under which a woman up to the age of 42 is considered for IVF treatment. But it's my understanding that those women will be undertaking for the first time. So to get into the dialogue about three cycles for that um, age group of 40, 42 is probably a different debate in that we would have to really be mindful of a lot of the pre-work that can, um, that can pre go ahead of the actual IVF treatment itself. Um, the things like the stimulation of ovaries and that process can take, a, uh, I, I understand, can take a significant number of weeks, and that the woman would also need a period of a break between cycles. So we, we do have to take best clinicians' advice on this. But I do welcome the motion, and I welcome both amendments that have been cited um, beside it. And I certainly would encourage everybody in the House to support all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, uh, members. According to my mobile phone sitting in front of me. It is now 13.56 hours. Question times due to start at 2 p.m. So I suggest that the House will take its ease until then, and this debate will continue after question time when the next member to speak will be Mrs Kelly Armstrong. Okay, members, uh, we are resuming the debate on the uh, NICE uh, guidelines, and the next speaker that I had on my list is uh, Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, coming back to um, the motion on IVF, um, IVF is something that is very personal to me. Um, I haven't hidden the fact that I have been through the process myself, and I can only pay absolute tribute to the patients' kindness and professionalism of the Regional Fertility Centre, who looked after me for nine years. Um, IVF is painful. It's emotional. It's devastating. Um, I unfortunately was not able to um, have a child as a result of IVF, but um, all I can say is it's not something that I would ever have regretted doing or do regret. Um, I would also like to thank Fairness and Fertility. And Gemma Dolan earlier had mentioned about the um, event that they held in the Long Gallery, um, which brought back an awful lot of memories for me. And of course, to the Fertility Network, who have worked extremely hard um, to try and get this um, brought forward for Northern Ireland. So I say to anyone who's wondering why three rounds of IVF, um, quite often people will find when they go through IVF, it takes a period of time for people to um, get the right drug mix in place in order for IVF to actually work. There may well be a case when you go through IVF that there's a failure to obtain any embryos. Um, the fresh and frozen, I did not have any fresh transfers done because I developed, as many do, ovarian hyperstimulation, which means you end up with full of fluid and normally in hospital for a period of, of a week or more. Um, so therefore, it's not an easy process to go through. Um, the three rounds are important because 
you may take time to settle down that medication. Uh, the first time is not always the first one that works. Anybody that does work for, congratulations to them. Um, but when you say to somebody, no, we're going to take away the opportunity for you to ever have your own child, um, it's better to hear that from a doctor than it is to, from a bank manager. Um, so what I would say is that the three rounds are very important. Not everybody will take the free round, three rounds, because once you get pregnant, um, that would be it, you know, and hopefully you have a healthy pregnancy and, you, and your baby or babies at the end of it. Um, but there are others who would like to continue their family, and the three rounds, for some of us who have fertility issues, is very important. Um, but we have to be realistic, and I appreciate that the Minister will have competing priorities. Um, some of the investment may indeed have to come from education, um, as with Amendment 1, where we talk about fertility education. I think we need to be very honest with our young people to say that fertility and that whole aspect of life doesn't always go smoothly. Um, there are many people who find out that they have secondary infertility caused after a miscarriage whenever the process after miscarriage leaves you infertile. Um, and I think it's something that we should consider taking forward with our Minister for Education um, to ensure that people are told exactly what can and cannot happen um, when it comes to regards to fertility. I'm very grateful that amendment's there because um, if somebody had said to me in my teenage years what the future was going to hold, I probably wouldn't have believed them, but at least I would have been prepared and known where to go to seek support. Um, Many people that are currently sitting, and I've actually spoken to quite a number of women, as you can imagine, with me going through the process and being a bereavement counsellor for a number of years. There have been many people who are currently going through the process who have said to me, am I out? Is this not going to happen for me? I didn't get any embryos. Or whenever they did the frozen transfer, that was it. It's all over and done with. There are many people out there um, who are saying, can we find out as soon as possible, Minister, when this is going to take place? And the, sec or the amendment number one alludes to that, where there is a time pressure on from the age of 35. Um, so what I would say to you, Minister, is the technical medical solution is available for those of us who have fertility problems. It's something that we will all go for. But before somebody remortgages their house, they want to find out how quickly this may come forward. And I appreciate that there are a lot of priorities. And there are some people who will say, sure, what's this fertility thing? Sure, cancer is more important or heart problems are more important. And looking after people, it shouldn't be like that. When part of your body doesn't work and it's letting you down, and when society expects you to have a family, and we have a system that can help us through that, then we should offer that to people here in Northern Ireland, especially given the fact that their sisters or their, their friends in Scotland can have the same thing. So all I would ask Ms. Uh, is to the Minister is, when you're considering this coming in, and I know you have a lot of pressure, especially with your budget, is to let people know so that those people who are stuck in that situation, who are 35 or 36, who maybe have done one round and are thinking about going through for their second round or haven't had their first round yet, whether they will remortgage their house or wait. Thank you. I thank the member. Uh, the next person on my list is Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I'll not be taking too much of your time this evening, but as we know, commitments were given years ago to work towards implementing the optimum number of cycles recommended by NICE guidelines. Let like I thought, a lot of things here, we are still waiting. I think that we've waited long enough, especially to keep the situation under review, and that we are frequently told that the government needs to live up to the commitments in the new decade, new approach document, and the calls for three cycles to be accessed here in Northern Ireland on NHS. We know that. Uh, we know how um, expensive this is for people in the system and how much personal and financial costs that people go through. We know that multiple rounds of IVF increases the chances of having a baby. And we know from research that multiple cycles increase the chances and it was reported that two thirds of women under 35 in a study in Australia would be pregnant after three cycles. Whilst we need to be mindful of these stats, we know that increasing the, n the numbers of um, IVF cycles available in Northern Ireland, it's also important that same-sex couples are included in this guidance and provision. There must be adequate funding and that the regional fertility clinic must be properly resourced and have adequate capacity to reflect the demand, especially for programmes such as, um, sorry, especially for other programmes. I will end this on a very short shout out to a couple of my friends. A few weeks ago, they welcomed a baby to the world after IVF. They would be very grateful if there was more, more, more rounds were available to people on the NHS and have also commended the NHS on their aftercare that they received. I would just like to say welcome to the world, baby Jenna, and you're much loved and I cannot wait to see you soon. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And in years to come, she'll be able to look herself up in Hansard. So well done to the member. Um, the final speaker that I have is Mr. Jerry Carroll. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm very glad to have the, the opportunity to uh, support greater access to fertility treatments in this debate. Uh, we know that this is an issue which has uh, caused great distress uh, to a great many people and couples, and we've heard that uh, today. Uh, and I'm sure those who are currently uh, struggling to conceive uh, will be feeling a bit of relief that their journey to conception may become a lot more hopeful uh, from today onwards. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I want to pay tribute to the campaigners who have been fighting for this change for years, the many who have shared their heartbreaking experiences, the many who have given up their time to gather signatures, to protest and to meet with politicians uh, as well. Uh, they were told that we do not have the money to offer more cycles, more cycles, but they kept up the fight. They were told uh, they might just get one more cycle by previous health ministers, but only if budgets uh, allowed, but they kept up the fight. Uh, if we do see three free cycles of IVF on the NHS, it will be, it will be because of the hard work, uh, sustained pressure and passion of those campaigners, many of whom will never avail of these changes because time has passed. Uh, we owe them a debt, Mr Deputy uh, Principal, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I am concerned, of course, um, that the Minister for Health uh, said recently that the Regional Fertility Centre uh, does not currently have the capacity to meet the need uh, if the Department grants three cycles of IVF uh, on, the, on the NHS. We need to see urgent action um, to address this issue to ensure there is absolutely no hold-up in offering more cycles uh, of IVF uh, via the NHS. Uh, similarly, uh, we must ensure that any changes to IVF access does not see more barriers erected for people uh, who are struggling to become parents, for example, having to prove that one, is, one has been trying to get pregnant uh, for up to two years could prevent obvious and unnecessary barriers uh, for lesbian and trans couples, uh, for example. Um, um, just to conclude, Mr uh, Deputy uh, Speaker, we and People Before Profit support access for couples, those who are single, regardless of their sexuality, and as late as is considered possible by health experts. We also believe that we should roll out a fertility education and information programme, but that it must be inclusive and up-to-date. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I call the Minister for Health, Mr Robin Swan, to respond. The Minister will have 15 minutes. Um, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I start by thanking the members for proposing this motion, which provides us with the opportunity to consider the commitment that was made in New Decade New Approach, um, the document to providing three funded cycles of IVF, and also those who brought the amendments and have spoken here today. I am pleased to see this commitment. In fact, as has already been stated during the debate, it was actually my party that actually requested and secured the statement within New Decade New Approach, the, the document itself. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, when we debate in this place, when a debate is, is broken by question time, it is often difficult to keep the thread and interest and momentum going. So can I thank members for, for retaining the interest in, in this subject, because it is, it is very emotive and sensitive, as the Chair of the Health Committee said in his opening comments, and it has something that is, has touched many of us. But I think the personal contribution that we have just recently heard from Ms Armstrong brings it home, I think, to those who are listening to this debate and those of us who are still in this chamber, that when we speak in here, we speak from a personal approach and a, a personal experience and a lived experience, which brings a realism to the, the, the topics that we're debating on. And, you know, I, I pay tribute to, to Rachel's friends and family as well who, who have been successful. Because for too long, women and hopeful couples in Northern Ireland have had to experience the imbalance of IVF provision, far below that which is often available in other parts of the United Kingdom. So if there is any minister in the executive committed to delivering this policy, it is me. However, significant additional funding will be required to make it happen. As with other New Decade New Approach commitments, this will be an issue for the executive to take forward collectively. However, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, it is not just the money which is needed. As has been stated, the Regional Fertility Clinic, which is the only health and social care provider of IVF treatment here in Northern Ireland, has advised me that it is neither the physical capacity 
nor the staffing resources to offer these additional cycles at this minute in time. Although these are significant constraints, I am keen to find a way to give effect to the commitment that has been made to those struggling with fertility issues in Northern Ireland. I am therefore establishing, as a matter of urgency, an operational working group to consider, on cost, all pathways and methods for providing these cycles and report back to me with options. This will include the scoping of delivering options, eligibility of women who have already undergone, undergone publicly funded treatment or who are already on the waiting list, the funding requirements and an implementation for timescale. I have been asked whether the independent sector, either locally or abroad, could be used to help deliver the extra cycles. I can't give at this moment in time a definite answer at this stage, but this is an option that will be, will be considered by the working group. However, assisted reproduction is, heavily is a heavily regulated service. So if any woman were to be sent abroad for treatment, it would have to be somewhere which operates to the same standards as those set out by the Human Fertilisation and Embryo Authority in the United Kingdom. I understand that fertility is a time-limited biological function and that achieving a successful pregnancy becomes more difficult as a woman grows older. So I appreciate the urgency of this issue, particularly for some women who are nearing the upper age limit for publicly funded treatment, but who still wish to start or grow their family. So on that note, I have also been asked about the possibility of expediting treatment for those women in such a situation who are on the waiting list. I can advise Mr Principal Deputy Speaker that the policy for some years has been, and in the interest of fairness, that women have been treated in chronological order from the date that they were added to the waiting list. To give preference to older women might be seen to disadvantage younger women who would have to wait longer and then would, would themselves be older when they receive their treatment, which could reduce their chances to success. But nothing is ruled out at this stage, and the working group will also look at whether the three cycles can be immediately introduced for older women in the 35 to 40 year age group. So if there is a fair way to expe expedite treatment for older women on the, on the waiting list. It is also critically important that we support women to prepare for a healthy pregnancy. Indeed, key recommendations by the Regulation and Quality Improvement Authority in its 2017 review of the maternity strategy focused on strengthening preconceptual care. And these recommendations included putting in place a pathway for preconceptual care, including for women with specific medical conditions, and reviewing the role of primary care in the provision of pre pregnancy counselling to both high and low risk women. So, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I intend to commence a review of maternity and neonatal services shortly and will ensure that my officials carefully consider progress on these important issues as part of that review. I, like other members of this House, have received a lot of correspondence surrounding this commitment, both from members of this chamber at a cross-party level and from the public. So I recognise that there is a lot of interest in and support for this commitment. To that end, I would welcome the support of all the parties when decisions need to be made by the Executive to allocate the funding to enable the provision of extra IPF cycles for eligible women. Mr Speaker, to conclude, I would like to assure the members that I am committed to the implementation of this New Decade New Approach Pledge, subject to the necessary funding being made available by the Executive, and has been indicated in this House. All members and all parties seem to be supportive of that desire. Thank you. Thank the Minister. And just uh, if I could let him know, Kelly Armstrong as the Alliance Chief Whip had to go to the Business Committee, otherwise I'm sure she would have been in for the remainder of the, of the debate. I call Paula Bradley to wind on Amendment No. 2. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And I don't intend staying on my feet too long because I think there's a general consensus from everyone in the Chamber around this and the, the two amendments. Can I just start by thanking um, the members facing me for bringing the amendment to the floor of the House? and to the members for um, the, the First Amendment and also to my colleague Pam Cameron um, for the Second Amendment. Can I also wish the new Chair of the Health Committee all the very best in his role going forward. Um, you should do a much better job than the last one, so very good, good luck with that one. And to Pam also um, as your Vice Chair. Um, I, I'm saying that I don't think there's too much more, more for me to say because I couldn't possibly follow Kelly Armstrong and her very heartfelt 
um, speech here in the chamber today. I think it's always very positive for us as MLAs to share our experiences that we have in life, and I know the minister himself has shared his own experiences in this house, as of others. Um, and I think that shows that we have got an empathy with our voters and with the people who, who, who elect us. Um, and this certainly is, a, as the chair said, or sorry, as the chair of the health committee said when he opened, a very emotive and, and sensitive matter that I very much hope all parties get behind you as minister in bringing this forward. Um, I just want to make a, just a couple of, of, of comments. Um, I was one of the originals um, in 2012, seems like such a very long time ago, um, when this committee motion, as it was then, was brought forward. Both <coughs> Pam and I both spoke on it because it was something back then, um, when we first became MLAs in 2011, that we wanted to see pushed forward. And I know we were knocking on Edwin Putz's door on a daily basis on this because we both sat on the all-party group in fertility at that time as well. But it's, you know, it's, it's, it's rather sad that we haven't seen much progress since then until now. So I welcome that progress and that it being in the, the, the New Deal report. I also welcome the support for our amendment uh, number two. I think it was mentioned there earlier um, the, about the sexual health strategy and about informing people better. We haven't had a sexual health strategy here in so many years. I think in around 2012 or 13 there was an addendum put down um, to the original one. Um, we need to be taking that more seriously um, for so many reasons. Uh, and this, uh, this is just one of them, but there are many other reasons why we need to have that in place and also that awareness and that we can break down those taboos when we talk about uh, infertility uh, and, and also about our sexual health. Um, so I very much welcome being part of this debate today. I thank everybody for their humility. And uh, again, I just want to say a special thank you to Kelly Armstrong for her co contribution today. Thank you. I call on Mr. Colin McGrath to wind on Amendment No. 1. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I begin by welcoming the Minister's announcements in his remarks uh, for an operational working group to investigate these matters that we have discussed here today? Um, if these do bring the answers that we have been seeking, I think that we will be able to demonstrate to people out there that devolution works, and that is a very positive message to be able to send out to people right across the north. I also welcome to the remarks that you make about uh, those uh, trying to support and help women in the upper age category. Um, I know that that will provide some support uh, and some soccer to people out there, and hopefully that will help them in what will be a very traumatic situation for them too. Um, I also thank members for uh, and welcome the opportunity to have this debate. Um, members across the House have spoken in almost unison today that there is an identifiable problem and that it does need to be addressed. We are aware of what the issues are, and most speakers made reference to them. Uh, we know that there are mental health problems that are associated uh, with the infertility. There's um, the disparity between uh, other devolved regions and ourselves, and that we want to try and seek that equality. Um, we have understood and we have mentioned the unfair financial burden that couples and families are put under as a result of the situation. And also, to just how it's a taboo subject, the mere fact that we're having this debate today, and hopefully uh, we will be able to send the message out and that there will be video clips of this debate, will send out that it is an issue that we're taking seriously, that we're prepared to have conversations about, and therefore that people, friends, families, and out in the community should be able to have those conversations too. But we do understand and I do appreciate that there will be an additional financial uh, requirement and that there are workforce concerns. But I hope that those issues are not insurmountable and that we are something that we can be able to work around. But, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, we are all uh, people, we all have friends, we all have some personal experiences, and I think that that has given this debate a particular personal touch through remarks uh, from Kelly Armstrong and others. And I think we all know people in our friendship groups that have gone through a traumatic experience. And the fact that we today here are trying to do what we can to help, I think, is a positive move. And that help that we can do is to provide hope. I think that if this motion and the amendments were passed, we would provide that hope. We would provide people that are in desperate situations that are looking for that hope. 
and we can help by providing that if we support the motion and support the amendments. And what I would appeal is that we do the right thing and we support hope for those that are in the perils of infertility. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now call Karen Mullen to wind the debate, and as she is winding, she will have 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I want to thank everyone who took part in today's debate, and I'd like to thank the Minister for being present um, for the full debate here today. I am pleased to wind up the debate on this extremely sensitive issue. Many will be listening and hoping for a positive outcome on full implementation of NICE guidance on fertility as a matter of urgency. As acknowledged by members here today, infertility is a medical and social condition that can cause considerable social, emotional and psychological distress. The psychological distress or the psychological and emotional repercussions of infertility cannot be overstated. And in some incidences, incidences infertile women can experience severe or clinical significant distress. This can manifest itself in depression, anxiety, sexual anxiety and difficulty, relationship problems with partner, family and friends, and an increased sense of self-blame and guilt. As outlined here today, couples and individuals experiencing fertility problems do not need the extra, extra financial burden and stress. For those experiencing infertility, the commitment given to prioritise three funded cycles of IVF in the new decade, new approach document was very much welcomed. In October 2018, Local Group Fairness and Fertility handed over a petition with over 10,000 signatures here to the Department of Health calling for equal access to fertility. Fairness and Fertility was established by dairy woman Deborah Cross alongside her husband Stephen. Deborah wanted to break the silence, highlight the inequality and in provision across these isles and the unjust financial burden and provide support to those women and couples going through IVF. The group's activities include lobbying, raising awareness, advocacy, emotional well-being, support and information. I have attended many events organised by the group and heard about the personal and financial stress, the emotional and mental impact that it has on both women and men. I have heard the pain that their family is never complete and the pain of missing out, missing out on the joy of that baby announcement many family celebrations and many first days. Like others, I commend the work of Fairness and Fertility and all our support groups who have continued to ensure that this long-standing inequality is kept on the agenda. In particular, I want to thank Deborah Cross and the members of Fairness and Fertility who shared their personal and painful stories to improve service provision. Kelly has outlined the importance for the three cycles here today, and I also want to join members in thanking Kelly for sharing her personal experience, which she has done on many occasions. Pam Cameron and Paula Bradley has raised the importance of education, and I, I welcome, I thank them for bringing forward the, this amendment to the motion. Gemma Dolan highlighted the limited fertility counselling support available, which needs to be addressed also. Over the last number of weeks, I and a number of other MLAs have queried details on the department's plans, timeline and capacity to commence and deliver. deliver. This again shows the overwhelming level of support that exists in this assembly and across all, all our constituencies. The Regional Fertility Centre at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast is the only centre in the north to provide publicly funded IVF cycles. And as raised here today, there are issues with both funding and capacity to deliver on the commitments laid out in the new decade, new approach. Again, I thank the Minister for being present for the debate and his understanding of those going through infertility. And I welcome the setup of the operational group um, and how quick that you have done that and turned it around. It will give much comfort to people watching this debate and, and, and out there, because as members have said, there has been a lot of interest um, um, 
And, and part of that, Minister, I would also ask that you consider the proposal coming forward, the amendment coming forward from Mark Durkin and Sinead Bradley to look at a short-term measure in relation to age profile. In rounding up, I call on members to support the motion and both amendments and appeal to the Minister to work as quickly as possible to full implementation, which will change the lives of so many affected by infertility. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that amendment number one, standing in the names of Sinead Bradley and Mark Durkin, be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that amendment number two, standing in the names of Mrs. Pam Cameron and Ms. Paula Bradley, be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the motion as amended be agreed. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. I think the ayes have it.